I want you to meet me back. I'm going back to Luke chapter 2. Yes, that's good. Thank you. Luke chapter 2. And since we read the first 15 verses, and you kind of know what's going on here, I'm going to pick up reading at verse number 21. Um, But before I do that, as I mentioned earlier, we're starting our Advent series on today, and we have titled our 2020 Advent series, Something to Look Forward to. Something to Look Forward to. It's in keeping with the theme of Advent, the theme of expectation and anticipation that we borrow from that theme and say something to look forward to. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at an account of something that happened literally just a few days after Jesus was born. Just a few days after Jesus was born, this account happened. And um, Luke records it in his gospel, the gospel of Luke in the second chapter. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 21 again. And before we do that, I'm just going to ask God to help us and breathe on us in this morning. Thank you, Father God, for this opportunity. Thank you for this opportunity that we get to look to your word and to hear from you. Would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts that would be changed by your word, not my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke. Chapter 2, again, beginning at verse number 21, I will read down to verse number 33. From the English Standard Version, it reads like this. And at the end of eight days, when he, Jesus, was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for the purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the wound shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought him, excuse me, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And Jesus' father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. This morning from this text, I would like to title our message, Do You See What I See? Do You See What I See? It is the Christmas time, so might as well be Christmassy. Please breathe the fresh on us this morning. A little over five years ago, I started noticing something strange happening with my vision that just didn't quite seem right. It wouldn't happen all of the time, but I noticed it most when I was driving, and particularly when I was driving long distances. As I would drive, my eyes would begin to blurry and start hazing up, and I would start having trouble focusing on things far away. I would have to blink my eyes and try to refocus things until things began to clear up again. And reluctantly, I told Lady Key after this was happening for a while that I thought I should have to go see the eye doctor to get things checked out, hoping that she would not tell me I would need glasses. And sure enough, the doctor had to end up prescribing me glasses, these glasses that I've started wearing over a little over five years ago. Some of you don't even remember me before I started wearing glasses, but I do. What the eye doctor explained and told me was that I had astigmatism. And as a result of that, the muscles in my eye and around my eye, they had to overcompensate to help me bring things into focus, especially things that were far away. 
She explained that when I was younger, I probably had never noticed it much because my muscles did their job to help correct this issue of my stigmatism. So I was able to see things far away without any problem. But because I was getting older, yes, we do all get older, basically my muscles began wearing out and they were getting tired of having to overcompensate and to work so hard. And so she prescribed the glasses to me. She said that it was best that I wear the glasses all the time because although I wasn't having trouble seeing things close up, that when I work on things like working on the computer or watching something on TV and my eyes were focused on something, even if it was in close distance for a long time, that my muscles would begin to to get tired. And so the glasses would actually help me to focus on things close up as well. But I can actually see things close up without my glasses fairly well. But what I have trouble with is focusing on things far off in the distance, especially if I have to focus on something far off in the distance for a long time. Even things close to me that I have to focus on for a long period of time can also put a strain on my eyes. I wonder if anyone else has difficulty with that same thing. Of course, I'm not referring to the physical condition that I have, but in life, I wonder if anyone else has trouble staying focused, keeping your eyes on what's ahead, keeping focus on what's to come, keeping focused on the promise of what's to come. I wonder what, if anyone else struggles with that like me. Or perhaps you have trouble focusing on the promise of what's to come, even if it's not even a reality for you yet. Or perhaps you're like me in that you've lost your focus. Many of us, when we began this year out, we were so focused. We were super focused. We were locked in. We had 2020 vision at the beginning of this year, didn't we? But like this year has been on all of us, this year has exhausted you and I. We are worn out. And the focus we once had has now began to dissipate and almost is completely gone. Now, I know that not everyone has trouble with this because I know some of you watching out there, you have no trouble staying focused. You have no trouble staying attentive and you're just always dialed in. You're always super focused. And I'm sorry, this message is not for you this morning if that's you. But for those of us who, like me, we have trouble staying focused as we approached this season of Advent, this season of expectation and anticipation, I was drawn to this passage of scripture this morning because I was intrigued by how Simeon and Anna later on in this chapter, how they were able to stay so focused on a promise for what at least seemed like a very long time. In fact, we know that Anna was 87 when she finally saw the promise of the Messiah. It seemed that they were super focused, that they waited for. And as the Christian Standard Bible says, that they were looking forward to the promise of the coming Messiah. That's what the consolation of Israel is. It is the promise that the Messiah is coming. And they were looking forward to that. They waited for that. And they were super focused. How was it that they were able to be so super focused when they were living during a time when it had been 400 years since God had spoken? That's what's so compelling about this passage to me is that if you know anything about the scriptures is that the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, it spans a timeline of 400 years, 400 years where God does not speak. He does not divinely inspire anyone to write anything. And it is complete silence. And this is where we pick up on Simeon and Anna being revealed the promised Messiah. It is after a long period of time where they did not even hear God's voice. 
This period of time had to have been bleak. It had to have been a dark season. And yet, for 400 years, they're on the other side of it, and they are going to now see the promised Messiah. Those had to be some bleak years. Those had to be some extremely difficult years to remain focused, to remain focused on the promised Messiah when it had been so long since it had even been prophesied that he was going to come. And yet they were able to stay focused. As we all know, this year, 2020, has been a bleak year, to put it lightly. For many of us, it's been difficult to find anything worth looking forward to this year. And as I saw someone say the other day, this year, 2020, has has been a pandemic of a year. There's been so much unrest, so much uncertainty, so much uneasiness, so much unexpected death, unexpected loss, unexpected disease. And it's taken a toll on just about all of us. Y'all, how are we to continue to look forward to something during such a seemingly dismal and difficult season? How are we to keep focused on the promises of God and on the promise of God when God seems to be silent? How are we to stay devoted and dedicated and disciplined but it seems there's not much worth looking forward to at all. Again, this is what drew me to Simeon and Anna's account here because they were under similar circumstances, under a dark cloud of heaviness, of silence, and even oppression. The people of Israel were under oppression, and yet they were able to remain expectant and anticipate and look forward to the promise. They were people who kept looking forward. They kept looking forward to the promised coming Messiah. And if I could just ask parenthetically, what are you looking forward to? What have you set your sights on? During this pandemic season, some of us have gotten distracted. We've gotten involved in stuff that we had no idea we would get involved in. What are you looking forward to? What have you set your sights on? What are you longing for? What are you expecting? And what are you anticipating? Because it's important for us to note that our expectations always affect our behavior. Our expectations always affect our behavior. You can always know what someone expects by what they do. If you expect to be a doctor, it will affect your educational plans because you're going to go become a pre-med student and take all of those classes for all of those years, accumulate all that debt so that you can become a doctor. If you expect to be a professional athlete, it will affect how you work out or that you work out. If you found out that you were terminally ill, I guarantee you that it would affect what you considered is important. If you're not expecting much, you know what? You're not going to do much of anything either because expectations affect our decisions. And so as we look into this passage this morning, I believe that it speaks to at least three groups of people this morning. The first group of people is the people who have lost focus. Perhaps even those who focused have now turned to something else or the wrong things. But the second group of people that I think it speaks to is people who actually need something to look forward to. And the third group of people I think that our passage speaks to this morning are people who are focused But you just need some encouragement and you need help staying focused. I wanted you to note the first thing that we see in this passage that helps us. The first thing that we need to take note of in this passage that will help us to stay focused and to to find our focus or to remain focused is in verse number 25. It says there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. How was he righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation? Because of how verse number 25 ends. Because the Holy Spirit 
was upon him. The first thing that we need to note about this passage is that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And here it is, is whether we have lost focus or we need to find focus or we need to remain focused. We need to know this, that we will need to rely and yield and become more aware of and sensitive to and dependent on the help and the aid of the Holy Ghost. There's no way of getting around it. Just like my eyes were getting tired and they were making things get out of focus and I needed help with glasses, so too do you and I need to rely on the aid and the help of the Holy Ghost. Luke has emphasized and re-emphasized the role of the Holy Spirit in these first two chapters of Luke. It begins in first verse um, number chapter one, verse number 15. It talks about the Holy Spirit. Then chapter one, verse 35, he talks about the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, he talks about the Holy Spirit. Verse 67, he talks about the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter two, verses 25 to 27, which we already read, the Holy Spirit is mentioned three times just in this account. You can't go very far in Luke's gospel without encountering the role and the significance that the Holy Spirit should have in our lives. And all too often, we treat the Holy Spirit like one of my sons, whose name will remain nameless, treats his glasses. He hates his glasses. He doesn't want to have to wear his glasses. And so what does he do? He forgets to put them on, or at least he claims to. He thinks he doesn't need them on, and so he loses them often. He lays them, he leaves them laying around the house. He doesn't even know where they are. He breaks them. He scratches them up. He disregards them because he doesn't know that he needs his glasses to help him stay focused. And that's how many of us treat the Holy Spirit. We lay the Holy Spirit around, forget where he is, and don't even go looking for his aid and help in our lives. But if you and I are going to get things back in focus, I want to encourage someone this morning. If we're going to ever find something really worth focusing on and remain focusing, remain focused, you and I are going to need some help. We need to rely on, depend on, be aware of, know the significance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're going to need to be more sensitive to, dependent on the role and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We believe that once you repent of your sins and place faith in Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit indwells and lives in us and abides in us. Matter of fact, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 6 tells us this, that when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, hear this, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Listen to verse 6. Whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so that means that when we place faith in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit living and abiding and residing in us. But unfortunately, it seems like we tend to underplay the role and the significance of the Holy Spirit in our life. And here's my encouragement to somebody. If you're a believer, you've got to be committed to learning to lean on and depend on the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to do a study on pneumatology this morning, the study of the Holy Spirit, but we will do that. I think I'm going to start this study in the beginning of the year. But we need to learn to depend on and lean on the Holy Spirit. You need to, you need to learn how to do it. You need to study and spend some time with the Holy Spirit. It's like when I think about my son, my youngest son, from time to time, 
He'll start playing on the floor with his toys and he'll say to me, dad, dad, can you play with me? Can you play with me? And what he wants me to do is to stop what I'm doing and spend time with him. That's what the Holy Spirit wants from you. He wants you to stop what you're doing and spend time with him. You know, we can resist the Holy Spirit. That's what Ananias and Sapphira did. They resisted the work of the Holy Spirit. And you need to know that the scriptures tells us that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And what many of us might need to do is to repent from the fact that we have been resisting how the Holy Spirit has been leading. And we have been grieving the Holy Spirit with our actions. Because the thing that the Holy Spirit wants us to do, the Holy Spirit wants us to walk in step with him. That's what Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says. It says, walk by the spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so as the spirit leads, we need to walk with him. It's real simple. Before you try to diagnose all that it is that you're supposed to do in order to, 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 um, to lean on the Holy Spirit and depend on the Holy Spirit, here's the first thing you need to do. Whatever you are sure that the Holy Spirit has told you to do, obey that thing. Whatever you are clear that God's word says to do and you know that God's word has been telling you to stop doing that or to start doing that, obey that. That is how you begin to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, I want to encourage you to pray and to ask the spirit to help you. And once you ask the spirit to help you and he begins to prompt you, obey him. As the spirit prompts, obey. Here's the thing. Jesus says in John chapter 14, he says that I will give you I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor or that word also can be translated helper to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. And so as we ask and pray that the Holy Spirit would help us, we need to know that he is here to help us. He wants to aid us. He wants to assist us. He wants to guide and direct us. Yes, he does. But many of us, We've been resisting him when he's been asking us to do something. He's been, he's been trying to guide us and we have been going against his guidance. When the Holy Spirit wants to help us, he wants to aid us. Matter of fact, there are three things, at least three things from this passage that we can understand about the Holy Spirit's work. And we need to, we need to grasp this. And the first thing is that we don't need to limit the Spirit's work. Because what is interesting about this passage is that it says that Simeon, um, the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. But if you know anything about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit did not fall on the church until Acts chapter one. And so we see here, though, that the excuse me, Acts chapter two, we see here, though, that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And many of us, we try to limit the Holy Spirit to a certain place or a certain time or a certain way. We think that this is the only way that the Holy Spirit can work or this is the only time that the Holy Spirit can come or this is the only way that he can move. But guess what? You can't limit the Spirit's work. You can't constrain the Spirit's work. You can't box in the Spirit's work because the Spirit might want to hit you upside your head and tell you to do something and you need to obey even if it's not when you want to hear from him. Even if it's not where you want to hear from him. Even if it's not how you want to hear from him. Don't limit the spirit's work. Many of us try to limit the spirit's work to say, oh, he doesn't have nothing to do with that. Or he only has something to do with this. And I'm not going to call any of the things out because I know there are people on various sides of the spectrum on that. But I just know this. We should never feel like we can limit what the spirit wants to do because the spirit can lead us to speak in tongues. But the also the spirit can lead us to speak a kind word. Both the spirit can lead us to do. The spirit was upon Simeon and it wasn't the time for the Holy Spirit to be upon anyone at that time. But Simeon would not be able to do what he had been called to do without the Spirit's presence 
in his life. Y'all, that's so good for me because I know I have an idea of how I think that the spirit should work. But guess what? The spirit is not limited by your imagination. The spirit is not limited by your experiences. The spirit can lead and guide and reveal in ways that you would never expect. But the second thing that we learn is that the spirit reveals Listen, it says in verse number 26, and it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Here it is, is that the Spirit can reveal things to us that we can't get a revelation and see otherwise. And that's why we need to be really dependent on the Holy Spirit, because he might be trying to show us something and we're trying to resist him and we're trying to cloud that out so that it's out of focus. But he's trying to say, no, stay focused on this thing, because I have revealed to you something that only the Spirit can reveal to you. Whew. The Holy Spirit wants to help us. He wants to give us something worth looking forward to. He wants us to focus our eyes on the promise that will keep us in focus. And he is saying, listen, I'm trying to reveal myself to you. I'm trying to reveal my plans for you. But the third thing I got to move on is that also the Spirit guides. See, we can't just not limit the Spirit's work, and we need to know that the Spirit reveals, but the Spirit also guides. Look at verse number 27. It says, And Simeon came in the Spirit into the temple. He came in the Spirit into the temple. Here it is, is that Simeon went into the temple at the right time because the Holy Spirit was guiding him. And that's what I want somebody to hear this morning is that you need to know that the Holy Spirit wants to guide you into places at the right time. If you would just yield yourself to him, the Holy Spirit wants to help you. He wants to guide you. He wants to direct you. He wants to light your path so that he can lead you to the thing that only he can provide for you. The Holy Spirit wants to guide you. That's what he does here in this text. And I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to guide somebody in the next step that they should take in their life. And listen, don't you go ahead of the Holy Spirit. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. I tell you to wait upon the Lord because they that wait upon the Lord, their youth shall be renewed. They shall mount up as we go, as eagles. They shall soar and never Faint, never get tired. Wait upon the Lord. Don't go ahead of the Lord because the Holy Spirit's timing, God's timing is always better than our timing. The Spirit guides. The Spirit leads. It reminds me of um, earlier this year, I was able to, um, Lady Ken and I were able to go out of town and we were um, driving someone else's car. I won't say whose car it was, but it was a fancy car. And um, we don't get to drive fancy cars in our household because we have four fancy cars at our household. They're called sons. And so um, we were driving this fancy car, and um, for, for one second, I don't know, I think I was talking to Lady Kia, got distracted or something, and I, I had my hand on the wheel, but I felt the wheel turning in a way that I wasn't turning. I said, what is going on? And I remembered that the owner of the car told me that this car, it, it, will, it's, um, it will stay in a lane so that you don't swerve out of a lane unknowingly and hit another vehicle. And so what it was doing was it was reading the road and it was making sure even though I had taken my hand off the wheel that it would stay in the lane. And so here's what I did. I got I got I got kind of cool with it. I said, let me see if this thing will make this turn around this bend for me. So I, I, I said, I said, Lady Key, watch this. Watch this. We went around the bend and I just gently took my hands just off the wheel a little bit. And the car made the turn around the bend without my hands even having to be on the wheel. See, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. The Holy Spirit wants to take control and he's trying to say, I want you to go this way. But you know what we do? We take the wheel and we try to go this way because we're resisting the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit wants you to take an exit and you're trying to stay and go to another exit. The Holy Spirit wants to take you where you can't take yourself. 
He wants to reveal things to you that your intelligence and your education and your background can't afford for you, can't do for you. He wants to take you into places that your money can't take you and that your, your connections can't take you. He wants to take you and he wants to help you. He wants to guide you. Will you yield to him? Will you depend on him? Simeon went into the temple at the right time because he was led by the spirit. I wish we had a generation of folks who would be more led by the spirit, who would hear the spirit whispering and saying, you need to call and check on that person. You need to text that person. The spirit, you know what the spirit will tell you sometimes? The spirit will tell you sometimes, be still, don't move. The spirit will tell you, grow where you are planted. The spirit will reveal to you his vision for your life. And we, oftentimes, we have so much noise in our life that we can't even hear the Holy Spirit. And we're so distracted on so many other things, so many competing interests, that we can't even stay focused on the Spirit, what he has revealed to us. Y'all, the Spirit wants to help us, and he wants to deliver us. He wants to take us into things that we cannot get for ourselves. I hope somebody is hearing me out there. I'll never forget just a few weeks ago, out of the clear blue sky, someone texted me. And little did that person know that literally 30 minutes before they had texted me, I was having a dark moment. I was discouraged. I was having all kind of negative thoughts. And this person out of the clear blue sky texted me and said, hey, P, what's going on? How you doing? I said, your text came at the right time. And here's what they responded back to me. They said, listen, the spirit was urging me just to reach out to you and to encourage you to let you know that God is still going to use you, not to be discouraged and to keep going. How did they know that? It was the spirit. And here's what I know. I know that the spirit has been leading and prompting all of us. But are we listening? Are we saying yes to him? Because the more we say yes to him, the more we say no to the evil desires of our flesh and yes to him more and more. We've got to obey any promptings that he gives us, y'all. Many of us, no, all of us, we can stand to be more dependent on the Holy Spirit. I don't care how spiritual you are. All of us can stand to be more dependent on the Holy Spirit. Know that you can't limit what he can do. Know that he wants to reveal plans for you. And know that he wants to guide you. Some of us, we claim to be full of the Holy Spirit. We're not led by the Holy Spirit. And what we need to be are people who are not just full of the Spirit, but we are led by the Spirit. But the second thing that I need to mention in this text that we need to know, i got to move on, is that Simeon's vision that he was looking forward to was from the Holy Spirit. I mentioned it already. But in verse number 26, again, it says, and it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. See, Simeon had a vision of something that was worth looking forward to. He had a vision of something that he did not conjure up in his own personality, but he had a vision from the Holy Spirit. See, some of us are leading our lives with visions that are not the Holy Spirit's vision for our lives. And we need to have a vision from the Holy Spirit that will override the competing visions of this world. Because the truth is, is that we can conjure up an idea like that. Many of us, we wake, out the, we wake up um, out of the bed, roll over, and we got 100 ideas in our head already. But there's a difference, as Mark Batterson says, between one God idea and a good idea. 
And the thing that we should want most for our lives is a compelling vision given to us by the Holy Spirit. Have you taken time to ask God, to ask the Holy Spirit, is this your vision for my life? Or am I pursuing a vision that is counter and not online with your vision for my life? See, many of us, we settle our sights on things that are far short of what God has for our lives. And what seeming in the one of the reasons he was able to stay focused was because he had a vision. He had a vision that was from the Holy Spirit. It was not a man-made vision. It was not a vision That was manufactured by him. And if you're going to stay focused, if you're going to find your focus, if you're going to remain focused, you need to make sure that you have a Holy Spirit vision. You all know that the reflection from the sun is to supposed to let us see at night the brilliance of the moon. Did you know that? The moon has no light of its own. The moon is dark 24-7. Every hour, seven days of the week, the moon is dark. What happens is, is that the sun reflects off of the moon so that the moon that we see lit up at night, it is actually the work of the sun and not of the moon. Now, some days we can see a full moon. But there are other days we can only see some portion of the moon. Do you know why that is? Because whenever there is less than a full moon, it's because the earth has gotten in between the sun and the moon. And as a result, we see the moon waning. And so we don't see all of the reflection of the sun off of the moon. Why? Because earth has gotten in the way. And many of us, are not seeing the reflection of Jesus, the Son of God, in our lives because earth has gotten in the way. We are not operating off of God's vision for our life. We're operating off of an earthly vision for our life, a manufactured vision of our life. And many of us, earth has gotten in the way, and we are dark, and we need the sun to reflect off of us so that we can have light. But the thing is, we're letting earth get in the way. I want to help somebody today and tell you, don't let earth get in the way of people seeing God's reflection on your life. Don't let earth get in the way of people seeing the son of God being um, reflected off of your life. Don't let earth get in the way. You need, you need a vision. You need a vision from the Holy Spirit. And don't settle for anything less than a vision from the Holy Spirit. Because here's the thing, we get out of focus in life because we don't keep our eyes on the vision that the Holy Spirit has given us. I got to move on to the last thing that we need to see in this text and take note of. The last thing that we see is that Simeon's vision was to see Jesus. Simeon's vision was to see Jesus. Verse number 27 says, he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, Now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Y'all, his vision was to see Jesus. And the reason why he was so focused, the reason why even when the dark cloud of life was hanging over him, even when there was silence, he was able to stay focused because he wanted to see Jesus. Listen, I I know in the Baptist church, we don't talk most about the Holy Spirit. But listen, the Holy Spirit will help you stay focused on Jesus. That's what we need to stay focused on, y'all. The fact that he has come and he is coming again. And until that is radiant and bright in your eyes, you are going to get all focused. But you need the Holy Spirit to help you stay focused on Jesus. Simeon is like, God, I can go ahead and die now. 
I done seen what I was looking for. God is saying to us, do you see what I see? Do you see the vision that I have for your life? And do you see Jesus? Do you see what I see? I've told you this story before, but in closing, I've got to quickly remind you about Florence Chadwick. I hope you remember me telling you about her before, but if you don't, Florence Chadwick, after she had swam the English Channel, um, um, Channel, what was I about to say? The English Channel, she decided to swim the 26-mile stretch from Catalina Island to the California mainland. And y'all remember I told you that when she swam it the first time, she has the boats around to help her in case she gets tired. And the fog was so thick that she said she could not swim anymore. And when she gave up, she was just a half a mile from the shore. When she got on shore, they asked her, why did you give up? You were so close. She said, because I couldn't see the shore because of the fog. I could not see. I didn't know how close I was. They say you were only a half a mile away from the shore. Two months later, she decides to get back in the water and try this 26-mile swim again. But this time, it was easy for her because even though there was just as much fog as it was the first time, she was able to finish. And when she got out of the water, they asked her, they said, wait a minute, it was just as much fog as the, as the first time. Why, how is it that you were able, how is it that you were able to swim? And she said, this time it was easy because I kept a mental picture of the California coast in my mind as I was swimming. And as long as I didn't lose sight of where I was going, I could handle the trip. And that's what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us this morning. As long as we keep sight of where we're going, we can handle the trip right here. As long as we allow the Holy Spirit to help us and to lead us and to guide us and to keep us focused, we need to keep Jesus in focus. If we're going to stay focused on this earth, because there will be so many things that will compete for our time, for our energy, for our vision. But let's not settle for anything less than a Holy Spirit vision. I hope somebody is encouraged out there. So I want you to know that even though this Christmas season is like it feels like there's not much to look forward to, that you know that there is something to look forward to. Perhaps you're trying to figure out what is 2021 going to be like. You don't know. You're not even going to take the vaccine. You don't know if you're going to ever be able to go out and do things that you used to do. And you don't know whether or not there's something to look forward to. But I want to tell you that God gives us something to look forward to. Through the help of the Holy Spirit, he will lead us and he will guide us to keep our focus on Jesus. You can handle the trip. You can handle the competing Dangers and the competing visions. You can, you can be disciplined. Yes, you can. Because the Holy Spirit is aiding you. He's helping you. And he's abiding in you. Lean on him. Depend on him. Be more aware of him. Be more sensitive to him. Like Pastor Linda said last week. We don't just need God's word. We need the wind, his breath. And spirit of the living God, we pray that you would fall fresh on us. Mold us, shape us, lead us, guide us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Help us to depend on you. Help us to stop ignoring you. Help us to stop leaving you around the house and forgetting that we need your help. Help us, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please come and help us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.